Welcome and thank you for joining us for this webinar presentation. We are the Homeland Defense and Security Information Analysis Center, or HDIAC, one of three IAC domains in the DoD Information Analysis Centers operating under the Defense Technical Information Center, DTIC, within the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering. Our informative webinar series highlights current and emerging research and technology developments. It presents an opportunity for accelerating the DoD's leverage of these advancements by increasing awareness and fostering technical collaboration. HDIX serves as one of the premier information research partners and curators of technology advancements and trends for the homeland defense and security community. As such, our organization supports those working in the homeland defense and security domain of DoD research and engineering. We do so by helping navigate the vast landscape of scientific and technical information, allowing our customers to get a head start on their technical projects. With an understanding of the Homeland Defense and Security DoD research and engineering landscape, we provide research and analysis services. We help unlock access to information, knowledge, and best practices from government, industry, and academia to stimulate innovation, foster collaboration, and eliminate redundancy. We hope you enjoy this webinar presentation and that it serves as a catalyst for community collaboration and improved DoD Homeland Defense and Security Research. So my name is Gregory Nichols. I'm the Research and Engagement Officer for the Homeland Defense and Security Information Analysis Center, or HDIAC. And before we begin today, I just want to note a couple of administrative items. Uh, first, if you are dialed in by phone and would like a copy of the slides that were posted to the HDIAC webinar announcement, you can go to hdiac.org slash webinars and find today's webinar. When you click on it at the bottom of the announcement, it will say download presentation. Second, all participants are muted, but feel free to chat using the attendee chat window on the lower right hand side of the webinar screen as I will be monitoring that chat. However, if you would like to pose a question for the Q&A session at the end, please click the ellipse icon with the three dots labeled more panel options to bring up the Q&A window as part of your layout. And at the end of the presentation, I'll go over the questions and answers. And for the benefit of those on the phone, I will read the questions out loud uh, to the presenter. If you happen to have any technical issues during the presentation, don't worry, the full presentation will be available online now that I am recording, uh, check back on the HDIAC website. Once the webinar is posted, uh, the GoToWebinar button will take you to the YouTube link. And with that, I am happy to introduce today's webinar, titled From Lab to the Literal Field, Custom Fit 3D Printed Medical Devices and Wearable Sports Gear. Our presenter today is Dr. Michael Zavala. He is an Associate Professor of Mechanical Engineering at Auburn University and is the director of the Auburn University Biomechanical Engineering Lab, where his research focuses on human performance and injury prevention. Dr. Zabala graduated from Auburn University in 2007 with a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering. And he also graduated from Stanford University with a master's and a PhD, both in mechanical engineering in 2010 and 2013. Clearly he is an underachiever. Dr. My, uh, Dr. Zavala's primary research focus is on the biomechanics of human motion performance and injury prevention. He has a long history of research involving 3D scanning and 3D printing of custom devices for the human body and a strong collaboration history with the Auburn University football program. Other research endeavors have included ACL injury prevention, lower limb prostheses, uh, lower limb exoskeleton design and control. Uh, I've actually had the pleasure of knowing Michael for about seven years now. We met uh, before either one of us had beards, so it's been quite a while. And I'm very happy that he's able to be with us here today. So, Michael, thank you again. And with that, I will go ahead and turn it over to you. Great. Thanks a lot, Greg. I appreciate everybody and your attendance today to hear a little bit about the story behind some of this technology and some of the use cases that, uh, that it's been able to realize. So I'm going to go ahead and stop my video while I present. And I'm going to share my screen now. Let's see. Okay. All right, I think we should be good to go. Okay, so the title of my talk, as you already heard, is From the Lab to the Literal Field. And 
Um, let's see. It looks like maybe can can anybody hear me? Okay. Is the audio fine? Uh, a lot of clear here, I think, for me. Okay. okay, great. I'll continue. So from the lab to the literal field, custom fit 3D printed medical devices and wearable sports gear. First, I'd like to just show you an outline of what we'll be talking about today so that uh, there are no surprises and you can anticipate essentially what I'll be discussing. I'll, I'll start by showing a few images and some details of my lab. I run a biomechanics lab. I, I call it the Auburn University Biomechanical Engineering Lab. We call it the Aubie Lab for short. After that, I'm going to give a little bit of background about the connection that I have and that the lab has with the Auburn football program here in Auburn, Alabama. Uh, then I'll discuss how the technology related to 3D scanning and 3D printing was extended outside of the lab. We only really did uh, work in the lab for, for a short while, but very quickly uh, it was extended outside of the lab. Uh, I think you might hopefully find interesting some of the media coverage that has been, that has been done on this technology. So I'll show a, a brief clip from that. And I'm going to show you also a brief video that really details the, the entire process from how we go from 3D scan to 3D print for these various devices. I'm going to cover uh, the different applications. Sports application is really what's come up thus far. There are medical applications as well as military applications that you'll see towards the very end. I'm going to go over some lab-based testing results that we have some of the impact testing that we've done in the lab. If you have any experience with 3D printing, especially what's called a FDM or fused deposition modeling 3D printing, you know it's quite difficult to get strong parts. And our parts are being worn by, uh, well, NFL football players. So uh, quite strong, and we've been able to show that in the lab, and I'll go over some of those results. And then the last thing is field-based testing, and it's a little bit different, and I think you'll see what I mean. Uh, really meant to be, I would say, uh, admittedly a little less scientific, but a little bit more fun. So hopefully you'll enjoy all, all of it. So we'll start with the Obby Lab, my biomechanical engineering lab, 32 feet by 30 feet. It's a classical biomechanics lab. We've got a Vicon motion capture system, 10 cameras. We have an 11th camera we can place on a tripod as needed. We have two ground embedded force plates. Uh, I describe these to students as fa fancy bathroom scales. So instead of just measuring force in the upward or Z direction, we can measure force in all three dimensions. And we can do it at about 2000 times per second. So we have a data collection frequency of about 2000 Hertz. We have uh, uh, the brand is Delsys and the, the particular product is called the Trino wireless EMG IMU sensor. EMG is essentially a sensor that measures muscle activation. It stands for electromyogram. We can measure and detect muscle activation through the skin on a sensor that's simply just stuck to the surface of the skin. And those sensors are pretty interesting because not only can they measure muscle activation, but they can measure motion as well. So IMU stands for inertial measurement unit, and it can measure motion of the various segments of the various limbs on the body that we place these sensors. We also have a Creaform brand uh, 3D scanner. This is a handheld 3D scanner. You'll see an image of that here in a second. Uh, and this is where this technology began, was this handheld 3D scanner. This particular scanner, as you'll see, costs uh, in the neighborhood of twenty dollars to $30,000, so it's quite an expensive piece of handheld equipment. It's traditionally been used for things such as accident reconstruction. You can imagine you have a crumpled vehicle and you can do a 3D scan of that crumpled vehicle, and then you can measure the deformation of that vehicle, and you can extract from that crash parameters uh, to perform an accident reconstruction. It's also been used for reverse engineering. It's, it's pretty good at doing that sort of thing too. And then we currently have, actually now we have three uh, raised 3D brand 3D printers. You can see one of those there on the top right. They come in various sizes. That one on the top right there has a print volume of one foot by one foot by two feet tall. So we can do quite large prints with that specific 3D printer. So now a little bit about the relationship between the lab, myself, and Auburn football. Back in 2019, I, had, I formed the lab to start with uh, in 2016. So the lab was about a few years old by then. And uh, by luck or happenstance, my neighbor at the time uh, was the head athletic trainer for Auburn football. His name's Robbie Stewart. And, and Robbie, uh, knew a little bit about what my lab did. He basically knew enough to uh, to call me and ask me for help because that's exactly what he did when he had an injured wide receiver. 
uh, named Anthony Schwartz. Anthony went on to play with the Cleveland Browns for a few years. Uh, but anyway, Anthony had fractured his hand. I believe it was stepped on during a practice. And Robbie called me and said, I kind of know what you do in your lab, and I sort of know some of the equipment you have. Is there anything you can do to help Anthony? Is there something you can make for him? And at the time, he was thinking maybe carbon fiber was what his, his thought process involved. Well, we don't do carbon fiber, but I always joke that if Auburn football calls and asks for help, even if you don't know how you're going to help, the answer absolutely has to be yes. And so I said, yes, we can help him. And sure enough, the next day, Robbie put Anthony on a golf cart and carried him over to my lab at seven o'clock in the morning. And he came in and we set out to figure out how to help him. And so that's where this handheld 3D scanner comes in, this Creaform Go Scan $30,000 handheld scanner. So essentially what we did was we had Anthony hold his arm up and place his elbow on the table and we scanned his hand. And what this 3D scanner does is it provides something called a point cloud. And a point cloud, you can imagine, is uh, somewhere around, let's say, 100,000 to 200,000 points within a 3D space. And if you have enough points within a 3D space, you can visually perceive that as a surface. And that's exactly what it looks like. And so essentially what this scanner does is it provides a reading of the actual surface that's being scanned. In this case, the injured hand of Anthony Schwartz. And so we we're able to, to scan, provide a perfect 3D scan within sub, sub uh, basically uh, micron level accuracy, uh, a 3D scan of his hand, of his injured hand. And what we did was we took that, that essentially surface and we generated a, a device, uh, a clamshell type cast device that you can see there on the right that fits perfectly up against his hand. And so we got the surface from the 3D scanner we generated the 3D model and software to make this 3D printed device. We 3D printed it on the printer you see there. And, uh, and this particular print took a long time. It took probably 15 hours to print. Um, so essentially we had to send Anthony away and he came back uh, a couple of days later and we were able to fit, hit, fit, it, on, fit it on Anthony. Uh, and what, one of the things we were able to do was when we were talking to the athletic trainers, they said, well, we don't want the hard plastic against his hand because he's injured. And so they said, we typically use uh, this particular type of foam. And this foam has a thickness of, for example, five millimeters. And so we said, okay, no problem. And we're able to offset the model to 3D print the device to where we can inlay within the device that specific thickness foam. And now it actually still fits uh, flush right up against Anthony's hand. Uh, this this was a lot of fun. You know, we were in the lab and, and helping Auburn football football players. And when it got really interesting, really was about three weeks later when uh, Auburn University was playing Texas A&M at College Station. And, and I knew and my students knew that should Anthony come on the field, he would be wearing this device on his hand. It fits so well, he could still wear his glove, his wide receiver glove over top of it. So nobody else really knew he was wearing this. And sure enough, he came out on the field. I was watching it on my TV at home and he lined up at wide receiver. And the first play, he took the, the football for a reverse for a 57 yard touchdown. So you can imagine the elation that I felt. I always tell everybody that was the day that I scored a touchdown for Auburn football. So that's really what got this technology off the ground was that entire experience. Auburn kept coming back with more players and more players. They had the next player came Seth Williams. Uh, went on to play at the Denver Broncos and he had a shoulder injury. They said, can you make him something? And that's exactly what we did. And Seth's print took about 28 hours. So really, really long time to print. We made it for him and he wore it throughout the rest of the season. So uh, at this time, the College of Engineering, the Samuel again College of Engineering here at Auburn had written an article in our engineering alumni magazine about this work that we had done uh, because let's face it, football is interesting, right? And, and people want to read about football. And if you see a combination of, of engineering and football from the college's perspective, they definitely want to cover that, cover that work. So, so that's exactly what they did. And that article was, was released. And a short while after, I got a cold email from a trainer, an athletic trainer at West Virginia University. And he said, I read what you did for Seth Williams. I have a wide receiver with... Uh, the same injury. Can you make something for him? And, and I thought, well, we've been having to have these players come into the lab every morning on the golf cart and scanning them in the lab. 
I'm not sure how we're going to do this. But I told him, his name is Zach Foster, the athletic trainer. I said, well, if you'll work with me, look, we'll see if we can figure out how to do it. And long story short, we figured out how to do a 3D scan with an iPhone using the Face ID technology. And Zach scanned his wide receiver and we 3D printed uh, him a shoulder guard and we FedExed it to him over in Morgantown and the wide receiver wore it that next Saturday against Kansas State uh, and was able to play. And so you can imagine at this point in my mind, I'm thinking there is some potential here for this technology beyond uh, my biomechanical engineering lab. So uh, the next thing I want to show you is about maybe a two minute clip. It's from ESPN. It's ESPN coverage of the Auburn versus Mississippi State game. And this was a lot of fun because if you're familiar with college football, then you probably know the name Holly Rowe. And Holly Rowe is a sideline reporter for ESPN. She's one of their best, most widely known sideline reporters. And she had caught wind of what we were doing for the Auburn football team. And sure enough, when the ESPN came to town, she decided to cover what we were doing. And she came to the lab. And you'll see some video in here of her trip to the lab. And then she actually covered what we had done for Anthony Schwartz on the sideline. So I'll play this now and uh, hopefully you can see and hear it. Please let me know if you cannot. Yeah, that was a thriller throughout. Yeah. I mean, they, that was about as even a football game as you could watch. We watched a lot of it here in the booth as we were preparing for this game. Of course, Baylor and Iowa State was a thriller today, too. And another big night for Anthony Schwartz here tonight, Todd. Well, he's a big part of this offense as they go forward. Coming into tonight, only four touches on the season. Tonight, four touches for 88 yards. 22 yards every time he touches the football. They've thrown it to him. They've handed it to him. He's super fast. You've got to account for him every time he's on the field. And I think as this offense and this season goes, he's going to get his hands on the ball even more. Well, why not? Every time he's touched it, it's resulted in a first down. He's doing it with, as we mentioned earlier, a broken bones in his left hand. With more on that, here's Holly. Well, guys, Anthony Schwartz is on the field in large part because the Auburn athletic trainers and medical doctors reached out to the Auburn Biomechanical Engineering Department. They are using additive materials and manufacturing with a 3D printer to actually make custom protection for Anthony Schwartz. They use this 3D printer, they scan his hand so it's perfect fit to his hand, and then they're able to put it under his glove. It's such a low profile, it's like a second skin. He's out there because the engineering department got involved. Wow. Whole university. Here he comes again. Ooh, he got spun around and bounces right back up. It's like a hit from Brian Cole. Now, Holly, they look like they were fitting you for something there. We saw you in the video. I don't think Holly is playing hurt tonight, though. We're not aware of any injuries. Yes, Holly, are you okay? Yeah, I've got it right here. I, I have my custom molded piece. You see, they bolt it to this thing, so my wrist is protected, my hand is protected, and. Uh, I can tell you that it's light. I could catch a pass if you needed me to. And I just think it's really cool that they're using a 3D printer. It's the future here at Auburn. All right. So uh, obviously I, I love that last line. It's here at Auburn. That's uh, it's definitely something that you want to hear uh, in a situation like this. But uh, so that was a lot of fun. Uh, and um, I want to show you the next video is essentially the process uh, because, uh, you know, we showed you the, the media coverage and I've talked it through. But I think this will help you to really understand from the 3D scan to the 3D print exactly what's going on here. So uh, this minute, this uh, video is about a minute and a half.
Okay, so so the main thing I want to point out as you see this video is uh, the change in the amount of time that it takes for us to 3D print these. I mentioned before that some of these devices were taking nearly 30 hours to print, which is a long time. And if you consider the use of, of this technology in a medical setting, that's not ideal. And uh, one of the, the major technological developments that we've been able to do uh, by a work in the lab is to speed up these prints. And so a typical hand cast or wrist cast now uh, takes takes well under one hour to, to 3D print. So you can imagine now that this process has become extremely streamlined, uh, that the utility is, uh, is, is very wide, wide reaching at this point. So what are some of the applications? The most obvious that we've been discussing uh, thus far is athletics. So uh, our technology is used in dozens of collegiate athletic programs around the country. It's used by multiple NFL teams, uh, Major League Baseball, Major League Soccer. An interesting uh, note here is that uh, custom fit shin guards made with this technology was actually worn during the 2022 World Cup. Um, so that was, a, that was a lot of fun to watch uh, there. And then uh, aside from just athletics, and by the way, athletics, the, the use tends to be in response to injury, although we do have preventive capabilities as well, or we can make custom fit shoulder guards, shin guards, as you see here, thigh pads that you can wear prior to injury. But there's definitely a good use case for post injury application uh, because essentially this technology can can be made for really any part of the body. It's just a matter of can you scan it, then it can be 3D printed to, to protect that part of the body. And then the medical application. So I mentioned before that in athletics, we tend to see most application be medical, uh, but this has definite use case in just pure medical cases alone. So not, not just for that of athletics. Uh, 3D printed casts and braces are probably the most obvious application here. You can imagine now you're going from small, medium, large type commercial off the shelf devices to a cast that is made specifically for that person. And so it fits well, it fits perfectly as perfectly as you can possibly have something fit because it's made from that scan of your specific body. And so there's a lot of different applications here uh, in the medical space. And then there's DOD application. Again, really a lot of medical, um, and I'm going to cover some, some more specific DOD application, uh, but uh, we do see a lot of application for use in austere environments. So you can imagine that this would be extremely beneficial to have a system like this um, where you have uh, logistical constraints. And so you can essentially have stock present and uh, you can 3D print on demand whatever device you might need whenever you need it without having to have warehouses because you probably can't have warehouses full of, of equipment that you may or may not need. And so we see lots of potential application uh, within the DoD for this particular type of technology. So now I'll transition to some uh, testing, some lab and field based testing. Uh, the first couple sessions of testing that I'm going to go over are lab based and they are primarily looking at impact testing. So impact testing of in particular a custom fit shoulder guard uh, that is designed for what's called the body opponent bag. So if you've ever been in like an REI or Dick Sporting Goods, uh, you will have seen this particular body opponent bag. It's kind of the flesh colored punching dummy. You'll see an image here in the next slide. Essentially what we did was we scanned this body bag's shoulder uh, and used uh, the, the scanning and 3D printing technology to make a custom fit guard. Um, a PLA guard, if you're wondering the material, a PLA is one of the most common 3D printed materials. And uh, it's one of the materials that we use for our various applications. Uh, we put a shock shield liner on the 3D printed shoulder guard. This is a this is a, a liner that is quite frequently used by athletic trainers within the sports field. It's uh, it's essentially looks like ballistics gel. It does a very good job of attenuating load. Uh, it's pretty heavy though, and so they typically use the shock shield liner really when you're injured, not for a preventive, just custom fit guard type type situation. And then we designed an impactor. And essentially what we did was we weighted a football helmet and we have a, a drop, uh, essentially a drop tower set up. And we weighted the helmet such that we could match the momentum of an NFL linebacker. So we're thinking worst case scenario, what does an NFL linebacker tackle look like? Let's impact this shoulder guard with that amount of momentum and that amount of energy 
and let's see how it holds up. So here I am placing the guard on this body opponent bag. You can kind of get the idea of, of what the setup looks like. We tested three conditions. We tested the effects of, of a foam liner on the guard uh, and the effects of having no foam liner on the guard. And so, uh, so you can see there the three conditions, no padding with the nine kilogram impactor. Uh, the second condition was interesting. We had the question, well, what if the 3D printer shuts down in the middle of the print? Maybe you're 3D printing overnight and the 3D printer shuts down and you need to start it back up. Is that shutdown process, that interruption process going to affect the integrity of the device? So that's what we tested there. We interrupted the print for 24 hours. And then the last thing, as I mentioned, was we wanted to test uh, if there were any differences in the, in the results and the performance when we added that foam padding. We used the motion capture sense system that I mentioned before to record the impact velocity uh, of the helmet. And then we used the force plates that I also mentioned to record the impact force. And we hypothesized that for each guard, a break would occur after the first impact uh, and on or before the 10th impact. So we said, we think it's gonna last somewhere between one to 10 impacts. And remember, this is worst case scenario for what these guards might experience in the field. This is what the setup looked like. More specifically, you can see the, the, the molded or the modeled shoulder there with the 3D printed guard overlaid on top and, and A of the figure. B is the, is the drop setup, and essentially we had the tower, and I would have a grad student climb up a ladder and hit the release mechanism, and the helmet would uh, come crashing down and slam into the 3D printed guard. And here are the results. Uh, if we had no pad, the no padding condition here, you can see if you're interested in the impact force, we average about 2,000 pounds impact force, so really high impact force, about 11 miles per hour impact velocity, and uh, the no padding condition, we actually did not see a break. Uh, the interrupted condition, so we stopped the 3D print for 24 hours. We saw a break, but it was actually on the 10th trial. It made it all the way to the end. The uh, EVA foam padding condition with no interruption also did not break. And then we essentially kind of uh, shifted into Mythbusters mode and we said, okay, well, let's see what it'll take to break this thing. And we increased the mass. So we increased the mass. Um, up to 10.8 kilograms now, and we just kept impacting the device. And finally, finally, it broke in the 17th trial. But what was really interesting was that not only did the device crack, uh, but the helmet actually cracked as well. So we, were, we broke the helmet and the shoulder guard uh, at the same impact on that 17th trial. So needless to say, we were quite happy with these results. And again, if you have any experience with hobby 3D printing, especially uh, FDM type printing, uh, this is pretty astounding because most of the time when you take a 3D print off the print bed, you can even break it by just taking it off the print bed. So the fact that we're able to achieve this is, uh, is we, were, we were quite happy with that. So then the second session, uh, we, we asked the question, well, well, why constrain ourselves to FDM type printing? Uh, FDM, I don't know, I haven't really explained this very well, but FDM printing is essentially uh, the type of printing where you have a spool of filament and that filament is is pushed or pulled through a heated nozzle and then a layer is put down uh, and then layer by layer you build that device up bottom up typically that's the fdm style and so we had the question well number one does it matter which brand um, pla or, or material we use at the fdm but number two what if we used a completely different type three type of 3d printing and so in this case we decided to test a type of 3d printing called sla or stereolithography and to do this, uh, Form Labs is a company that's probably one of the most uh, the most well known company to make uh, desktop SLA 3D printers. And so we chose them as the the manufacturer of the method, and we tested their two types of resins that we thought would do the best: uh, the durable resin and then the tough resin. So again, in, in this set of set of tests, we're looking at the effect of material type, material brand, uh, and 3D printing type. Same type setup, we use the shock shield liner again. That, this is a really good simulation of soft tissue so that we felt, felt happy with that setup. Uh, we had to get a new helmet because the last one broke, but we weighted it with the original weight of nine kilograms again. We used the Vicon motion capture system to record impact velocity and the force plates to record impact force. In this case, we, we hypothesized that each guard, uh, for each guard, a break would occur after the first impact and on or before the 10th impact, we basically kept the same uh, hypothesis as before. So here's our, our slew of, of printed devices you can see there. Uh, we've got Form Labs Durable on the top left. 
we've got form labs tough on the top right and then on the bottom we've got raise 3d brand pla and we've also got hatchbox brand pla and the the final variable actually i failed to mention the final variable that we tested was the presence of holes or a lattice type structure in these devices because that's something that you commonly see with casts and braces and we wanted to know uh, what's the effect of essentially introducing stress concentrations is what you're doing when you introduce these holes what's the effect of introducing these holes on the devices so here's the results. Uh, you can see the Form Labs durable uh, material, both the solid and the hold version, uh, withstood impact and did not break. The Form Labs tough version also did not break. Interestingly, the Form Labs SLA uh, method tough, uh, tough resin hold version it did break. It broke in the third trial. Again, that's not too surprising because when you introduce the holes, you introduce these stress concentrations. The Hatchbox box brand PLA solid version did not break. The hold version broke in the fifth trial and the raised 3D solid version, interestingly, broke on the second trial. So really the take home here is, uh, is, is, is that the SLA print method is uh, sufficient. The Hatchbox FDM, Hatchbox brand print method solid version is sufficient. You start to see some loss in strength when you introduce holes. Uh, but interestingly, the raised 3D brand of PLA did not perform well and that was the solid version. And so uh, you can see really there is a, it is important to consider the, the brand or the manufacturer of the material that's being used for this particular type of application. So the last thing I wanna share with you is our field-based testing. And like I mentioned before, this is probably a little less scientific, but it was a whole lot of fun to do. And I think you'll see what I mean by that. So in order to do this, field-based testing, essentially what we wanted to make was we wanted to make 3D printed custom fit body armor. And that's exactly what we did. So this individual on the bottom right is donning our, our patent pending compression shirt and shorts. And essentially what this technology allows us to do is this individual will, will don the shirt and shorts. And then you can see the outline of these strategically placed pockets on these garments. Essentially, what happens is, is once the once the garments are donned, the three D scan is performed of the pocket, and then due to the contrast of the outline of the pocket with the garment itself, the computer can extract off the specific area where the pocket's located and can use that information to generate a three D computer model that can be three D printed to make something such as custom fit body armor that can be inserted into that pocket and then it can hold it and it can conform perfectly to the body. So. Um, so we use this technology to make a, a 3D printed body armor plate, essentially out of 3D printed titanium for, thankfully for him, not this individual down on the bottom right, but for again, our friend Bob, the body opponent bag. So we placed a similar type shirt on Bob, as you see here, except for we had the pocket located on his right uh, pectoral area. And we scanned that area and we created the 3D model and we had it 3D printed out of titanium, and we 3D printed it at a thickness of three millimeters. So a three millimeter thick titanium body armor plate. More specifically, Ti-64, if you're interested in the finish was basic, uh, and, the, and we did have them, uh, the manufacturers perform a stress relief. Now, I will say FDM 3D printers are very inexpensive. They range uh, from, well, for example, the Raise 3D in my lab costs about $7,000 and and you can get them much, much cheaper than that. To 3D print titanium, you're looking at at least five figures. In this case, it was probably a six figure cost 3D printer to do this. So there are obvious considerations there when it comes to that. So what do we do with this? Well, of course we want to shoot it and see how it does. And that's exactly what we did. So this is a 3D printed titanium plate. You can see they're made for the custom fit shirt. It's a little bit, the shirt here is a little bit, uh, I guess, more thrown together, less professional looking than the later models that you saw before, but it's able to accomplish what it was that we wanted to do. So we inserted the plate on our good friend, Bob, and, uh, and we took him down to the range and we fired rounds at him and we fired rounds specifically, we fired a 22 long rifle. Uh, if you know much about shooting, you know, this is not that much. This is what you use to shoot squirrels. It's not a very large round. Uh, we also fired a nine millimeter pistol, full metal jacket round nose. Um, and uh, finally, we fired a 223 pointed soft point. 
Well, uh, here's what we saw. The 22 long rifle, uh, the, the 3D printed plate was uh, stopped the round. It also stopped the nine millimeter round. It was wholly ineffective at stopping the 223, perhaps unsurprisingly. And we learned a lesson. Uh, that lesson was that you can't just stop the round, you have to catch the round because uh, the even though even the 22 and the nine millimeter rounds that were stopped, the result was that shrapnel was dispersed uh, circumferentially around where the impact occurred and up into the uh, the bottom of the jaw and the throat of our good friend Bob. So uh, so again, stop the rounds, but of course that's that's not all that's required. So uh, it's hard to say what the potential of this particular technology is moving for moving forward. It's extremely expensive. 3D print titanium. You can see it stops small, small arm, small arm fire. It's not very good at larger round. And it's probable that this device would have to be coated in something like a Kevlar liner in order to, uh, to adequately stop the round. Um, so it, again, a little bit less than scientific, but, uh, but pretty interesting for us to go through this process to see what the potential looks like and what the future looks like. So personally, um, I'd be interested in pursuing something like this for maybe uh, some research out of my lab, but commercially, it's definitely not there yet. And that's all I have for you. So um, I think I'm right at about half an hour and I am uh, now I think we need to enter into the Q&A. So I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Hey, thank you, Michael. That was really awesome. And uh, we had quite a lot of engagement. I've got several questions for you already, and we'll probably get a few more as we start talking. So let's dive in here. In the q and I've got about five here. So first question, has TPU ever been considered as a material for the devices, not in replacement of the rigidity or the outshell layer, but for the interface between the player and the device? Uh, the short answer is yes. Uh, so. Flexible materials like TPU are notoriously difficult to print. Printing what we typically print uh, is difficult anyway, even when you're using rigid material, because if you, if you know much about thermodynamics, then essentially what we're printing is a heat fin. And so you get, you get massive heat distribution across the print surface, which typically will result in warping of the 3D print. And if the whole purpose is to do something that conforms perfectly to the body, obviously you don't want warping to occur. So there are challenges associated with printing flexible materials such as TPU, uh, but it is something that is definitely a consideration, yes. And then related to that, uh, what software was used for the scan, manipulation, CAD modeling, and slicing? Yeah, so it really depends. And I, I probably have a gnat flying around my face here if I'm batting this thing away, but um, it it we've used all kinds of software. So there's a lot of open source software for 3D model manipulation. Um, so uh, there are uh, various 3D printer companies have their own slicing software. So it just depends on the 3D printer you use. We've used numerous brands of 3D printers. Uh, there is one type of slicing software that's, uh, I believe it's open source. Uh, it's, called, um, it's called Cura and it's done by a company called Ultimaker. Ultimaker is a 3D printer company but their slicing software, Cura, can be used for multiple 3D printers. So it really just kind of depends. At this point, though, we, we pretty much have everything custom to what we, what we need to do ourselves. So everything is, is in-house. All right. Here's an interesting question. I'm curious about this myself. The scanning apparatus used in a 3D printed cast video looks DIY. Is it possible to make one myself? <laughs> well, uh, so you can, there are 3D scanning apps available on the iPhone. And so, uh, you know, 3D scanning and the move from a handheld $30,000 3D scanner to something in your pocket is, is not really novelty that we have introduced per se. So the short answer is yes, you can download 3D scanning apps on your phone. The subsequent question is, is how do you access the scan and what can you do with it? And so that's really where the challenge lies. All right, that's fair enough. And then our next question, could it be a feasible future application to have a new fast printing printer, such as the Bamboo Labs X1C, ship to deployment zones to print medical devices quickly for troops? Uh, all 
caps Y-E-S. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So what's great about what we're doing, um, we're not tied to a specific brand of 3D printer, which means we constantly monitor 3D printer technology and we constantly adopt the fastest and best 3D printers, such as the one you mentioned. And so if you look at, if you plot the trajectory of the increase in speed of 3D printing over time, it's really astounding to see how far it's come. Uh, and we expect that to continue. So, so yes, I couldn't possibly agree more that that is a, a definite future application, if not immediate application of this technology. Yeah, that's it. Well, excellent answer. Uh, good question too. So got quite a few more questions, which is wonderful. Right. So what printing stock is best to replicate the properties of steel? Ooh. Well, uh, you can 3D print steel correctly. Uh, we actually have here at Auburn, we have a national center. It's called the National Center for Advanced Manufacturing Engineering. And, and that's, I don't want to minimize it, but it's basically that what they do is they 3D print steel, titanium, and other metals and look at the differences in material property if you 3D print that metal versus if you cast that metal, for example, or if you or if you make a component in a more traditional way. So you can 3D print steel directly. Um, in terms of polymers that replicate the material properties of steel, I got to be honest, I, I don't know. I, I mean, there are, there are thousands of polymers you can 3D print with, and they all have their own properties. So I really, it just kind of depends on what you're trying to match, because in a lot of cases, you might get increased tensile strength, but you'll have increased uh, brittle brittleness. So it just really depends on your specific specific application and what it is you're trying to do. All right, and then this is um, I think more of a comment, but I'll see if you've got maybe a response to this. So somebody asked, well, somebody stated that their biggest issue is scaling the scan once I've completed the scan via a phone app. So I don't know if you've got any. Um, you know, advice on on how to handle that. I'm sorry. Can you can you ask me again? I didn't quite catch it. Yeah, it was a question about scaling the scan once they complete the scan via a phone app. Scaling it. Yeah. Okay, so I guess I would I would respond with a question of um, of what would be the purpose of performing the scaling because in our in, in what I've presented today it's a one-to-one -one where you get the scan and it is the exact dimension of the body that you've scanned and that's exactly what you want. Um, so maybe the question was related to the offsetting. Could that, is that possible? I don't know. Um, yeah. But we'll, we'll be, I've got some more questions to move on to. So yeah, okay. um, we're happy to, if you got any additional comments that you want to put in here, we're Michael and I can address them. Mainly Michael, I'm just the, Facilitator. <laughs> All right. I've got several questions that came up in the chat here. So I've been tracking these. Let's make sure we get these. Uh, so the first one was a good question. It was from earlier in your presentation. Uh, alleviation of which bottlenecks in the manufacturing process allowed you to speed up the process from 30 hours to one hour? Yeah, great question. Unfortunately, not one that I can answer. Um, that is that is one of our major competitive advantages is uh, having having made that determination and uh, you know it, it probably took about two years to refine everything so it, it's not one thing it was a combination of a lot of different things and uh, you know again the the ability to three D print quickly a lot of what we make can be done in twenty minutes and so the ability to do that is, uh, is is a major advantage i think that we have with our specific technology so unfortunately i wish i could give you more information but uh but that's uh that's just the way i think that's uh that's all i can say on that yeah that's a fair uh ip dodging question um all right so this one i think i've got this right it came in around slide 20 i think it was related to your impact testing slide uh, the Ray's 3D case also had the highest impact force of all the cases. Is that why it failed? Yeah, it, well, I think it'd be helpful. I'd have to go back and look because what I presented was the average force. Um, and so that's a, it's a good question and it's something that's worth looking into to look at uh, how, did the, how, did, how does the impact compare leading up to that break. Uh, but I will say that anecdotally, we have found the Raise 3D brand 
to be much weaker across the board. And I'm, by that, I mean it, when it's used on the field. And so we originally set out using raised 3D brand filament because we were using raised 3D brand printers. And uh, we would occasionally have devices used in the field, as in football, we'd have devices break and we couldn't figure out why. And that's really what led us into this exploration. And, uh, and that's continued to be our experience is that certain brands that one included uh, tend to just for some, some reason, they just tend to be more fragile. So it's possible that that was the reason why it broke and the others didn't. But, but again, anecdotally, quite consistently, that's been our experience on the field. All right. And then this one is um, a statement, but it may be helpful. Um, the only way, and this goes back to the ballistic testing that you had mentioned towards the end. Uh, yeah. The only way to compare ballistic material is to discuss the complete package as a whole. Um, ARL and NRL, people who do ballistics research use the term V50 to characterize things. And then there was a recommendation to reach out to some of the ARL folks who do that kind of research. And I can connect yeah. you to that commenter. That'd be great. And, uh, and you know, it's probably apparent we are no experts in ballistics and armor. Uh, and so I know that's a complicated topic and there's a lot of uh, considerations that have to take place there. So, um, so yeah, any information I can get would be helpful. And then this one, uh, very interested in your acceptance process. How do you get the user or the item manager to accept added manufacturing as an alternate manufacturing method? Well, it depends on the user. Uh, the majority of athletic trainers within sports tend to be um, younger individuals in their early to mid 20s uh, that are quite comfortable with, for example, face ID technology, iPhones. Um, and so the adoption and the interest just in 3D printing alone is really, really high. Uh, just put succinctly, 3D printing is interesting to a lot of, a lot of people. Uh, when we're talking in the medical space, really now it comes down to improved patient experience. Uh, what this technology is able to offer is custom fit. And so the patient gets something made specifically for their body. It's more comfortable. And there is lots of literature to indicate uh, because we're not the only ones that have done this. We've really, we've done this on at scale, which I think is what makes us unique. But there have been a number of pilot studies conducted within the literature and uh, it, it fairly consistently shows that custom fit 3D printed devices ca like cast and braces are preferred by the patients and the outcomes are just as good or better than the traditional casting. And so, um, so it's really patient centered focus. And then the final thing is, is if it's a custom device, if you, if you consider reimbursement, uh, it, it, it's reimbursed at a higher rate. And so if there's a financial consideration there from the, from the clinician, for example, this device that's being made for that patient is custom fit and therefore uh, it, it demands a higher reimbursement rate. So there are a lot of reasons why uh, the end user would want to adopt this technology. I'm just thinking back to my old Navy Corman days where we used, you know, the, the old fiberglass gel filled splint material, things like that. I, I think having something like this would be an advantage in certain situations. So um, I'm kind of bummed out that I missed some of this in my, my healthcare days. Yeah, All right, we've got a few more questions. Uh, this one's a little bit more about structure. So have you looked into different internal structures, 50 to 100 percent infill, triagonal versus hexagonal, for example? Yeah, that's a that's a pretty heavy part of our internal engineering processes, uh, because, you know, it's like anything else. You don't want to necessarily over engineer it if you don't have to. Uh, and so uh, to answer your question, yes, that is something that really it's something we look at on a daily basis. I was I was uh, sending a paper that I found in the literature just yesterday to one of our head engineers uh, that addressed that very thing. And the good news is there's a good bit of that work that's been done in the literature looking at 3D printing of all types of materials. And so there's a lot that we have to draw from and that we can that we can utilize. And then it just becomes a matter of, well, how does it how does it work within our specific setting? So absolutely, that's a consideration we're always we're always uh, thinking about. And this is um, just a comment here, but it sounds like it comes from some real world experience. Uh, hard rifle plates, spalling and fragmentation is a well-known problem. A simple solution that works well is coating of the plate with a thick marine epoxy or truck bed cladding type coating. Mm. That's good. 
I, yeah, we've thought about that, um, the truck bed type coating. Uh, that's, an, that's an interesting solution. I know it's quite, it can be quite heavy, but um, I, again, these ceramic plates I know are already heavy, so it's kind of, a, I guess, a trade-off, but, uh, but that's interesting. I've, that's, uh, it was a marine coating and truck bed. Yeah, a thick marine epoxy. Marine epoxy, that's right. Yep. That's right. That's yeah, interesting. I haven't heard of that. Uh, and this one is probably very applicable to, you know, kind of the modern day warfighter. But has there been consideration of combining a thin layer of Kevlar internal and or external to the appliances, possibly dropping the velocities for capturing projectiles? Yeah, I think there's a lot of uh, of good R and D that can be done with that. Uh, the the difficulty when it comes from my perspective, the difficulty when it comes to developing body armor technology is the cost. And so from a you know, commercial standpoint, it can be quite difficult if, uh, for example, the plate I showed you there, we sent it out for 3D printing and it was about $2,000 for a singular plate. And so uh, yeah, I really see the future of this technology being developed through government grant mechanisms. I think it has to be done that way. Uh, and so uh, I think that's a great idea. I think that I've thought a lot about that, and that's probably the path that this ultimately goes. I would love to see the the tech developed and tested, uh, but again, I think it has. We have to find the proper funding mechanism to make that happen. All right, that's a fair answer. Uh, two more questions uh, as far as we've got so far. Uh, what is the process from going from a three D scan of an arm to a three D model of the cast that wraps it? And is there a uh, CAD SOLIDWORKS type of step involved or something much quicker? Uh, well, it, when we first started, it was quite laborious. It took a lot of time to, to go through the process and uh, three or four different types of software. And, uh, and so that's been also a focus uh, of, of ours over time is streamlining that uh, and making that more user friendly and more accessible uh, because the end user is not interested in really any of those details. It's just, can I get 3D printed what I want 3D printed to treat that particular injury, for example? And so that's uh, that's been a big focus of ours uh, over over the, the I guess past three or four years is improving those processes and streamlining those processes. But it's just been a dynamic thing. Again, at the very beginning, it involved about four different types of software programs to get it done. Sounds extremely complicated. There are days where I'm glad I'm not an engineer for that very reason. <laughs> All right, last question um, before we do the the last call here. Uh, so this question applies to lattice software capability and topological optimization and the potential advantages there. So the question is, were the holes you introduced into the shoulder pad for experimenting purposes introduced systematically or randomly? Well, you might have been able to tell it was uh, it was randomly. Uh, essentially, we didn't have the capability that you saw in the process video, but at that time, we didn't have the capability to introduce uh, the holes uh, in, in more controlled fashion. So at that point, it was more or less randomly. But that's uh, that's a good observation and something that we we would probably want to test in the future is our our more automated approach. All right. Well, thank you, Michael, so much. I've got, uh, let's see, I think that was it. So I've answered, I think you have answered all the questions we have so far. We'll just wait maybe another 10 seconds to see if anybody else has any burning question they would like to ask, and then we'll wrap this up. But again, I want to thank you so much. It was good seeing you again. And the work you're doing is really cool. I feel like anytime you make it to an ESPN highlight, film you, you've done good work so exactly exactly it's fun it's a lot of fun thank you for the invitation yeah no problem and um again thank everybody who showed up i keep getting the same question i believe we've already answered it in the chat so okay um all right that's it again thank you everybody this recording will be available uh sometime in the near future on our website and if you have any other questions you can contact i'm sure michael directly or uh, or us when we get in contact with him. But again, thank you all and hope everyone has a great day. Thank you.